Right, so uh, well, welcome uh, all those uh, citizens of the internet. Uh, I'm, I'm here in the, in, in the hotel in Galway. So, so this is a history seminar, and the topic we are discussing is do modern Irish historians exaggerate the role of the Catholic Church uh, in independent Ireland? Uh, I, I've been doing some research, particularly on the tomb story, and as a result of that, I thought maybe there was uh, a need for uh, a, a sort of a wider discussion than just the question of tomb to see, uh, you know, are we at a point in Irish history where many of the citizens are left um, left in deceit as, to, as regards the recent history and that they, maybe there, there's an element to which the role of the Catholic Church has been exaggerated. So anyway, I, I'm going to speak directly to the topic, did home rule equal home rule in independent Ireland? I'll, I'll be speaking first and then Eugene Jordan is going to be speaking particularly on the uh, children's home and he'll answer questions on that and I'll, I'll hopefully answer questions on that too people uh, want to know about it. And then Rory Connor is going to talk about the various tribunals and investigations and, uh, and ask whether all of that stacks up in the way that it's supposed to. So, uh, so the first topic, as you can see, is myself. Did, did, Rome rule equal, uh, did Home Rule equal Rome Rule in independent Ireland? And for those who don't know, I'm sure the vast majority of people understand that phrase, but for those who don't know, about 1900, 1910-ish in Ireland, there was a big political agitation, we were going to get home rule, meaning we were going to get a kind of a local independence, not full independence, but local independence. And while that agitation was going on, in the north of Ireland, <coughs> some Protestants represented it that if we did ever get home rule, actually it would be just Rome rule. Actually the Vatican would dominate us, the bishops would dominate us, whatever. That was, that was what they said would happen if we did get an independent art. Obviously we did get independent Ireland early 1920s on, and during that time, I don't think anybody ever said that it was Rome rule. Anybody who knew Ireland at the time, you know, it was a ridiculous statement. The only person who did come from the 1960s on is one Dr. Ian Paisley, and that, that was the way he always represented Ireland, uh, the, the south of Ireland, that were Rome rule, whatever. Then, curiously, after Ian Paisley dies and after troubles end, that actually is the way people have looked on independent Ireland. They actually have said now that, that independent Ireland was dominated uh, by Rome. I think that's uh, wrong. I think it's exaggerated. I think it's false. So, so, so I thought maybe there was room to explore this subject and to see uh, what's true or not true in it. So <clears throat> the first step uh, in this journey is to examine, presumably, the role of the various uh, Taoiseach. Obviously, the Taoiseach of Ireland are the main political powerhouse until we join the EU anyway. And, uh, and let's see what their attitude was and whether it justifies this Rome rule uh, thing. Now, the first Taoiseach, although he didn't have the title, uh, would be W.T. Cosgrove. <clears throat> he, he, I think his, his official title would be the President of the Executive Council. I'm, I'm putting him in as the first Taoiseach because he's the first sort of Prime Minister, if you like, when things settled down a little bit uh, during the Civil War. And he, he reigned then for approximately, we'll say, uh, 23, 22 or 23 to 1932. <clears throat> so what was his attitude? Now, <clears throat> actually, he was a very religious person, uh, incidentally. The W.T. Cosgrove and his son, Liam Cosgrove, who later became Taoiseach, were very close friends uh, with Frank Duff. And th those who know the history of, of Dublin and the Catholicism, if you like, uh, you know, Frank Duff looms very large. He's the founder of the Legion of Mary. And he's arguably the most Catholic figure you're going to get in Dublin for many decades. And actually, he was a very close friend of W.T. Cosgrove. So, so yes, uh, W.T. Cosgrove was very religious, uh, absolutely. But it did not mean that he in any way wished to discriminate, discriminate against non-Catholics in Ireland. So that, that's where people are making the mistake. They're taking sincere Catholics and they're presuming that they're sort of bigoted, blah, blah, blah. And that's, in my opinion, a total mistake. Now, here, for example, is, uh, <clears throat> is a letter he sent to Archbishop Gilmartin in Chul in 1931. Now, I think this is over a controversy uh, involving a, uh, a, a controversy involving uh, a librarian. Uh, there, was, there was a big row in Mayo, I think it was, uh, whereby um, <clears throat> whereby some people objected to a Protestant librarian in a, in a largely Catholic town in the west of Ireland. And uh, uh, the bout, uh, if they ever come, what's the <laughs> it's, like, it's actually not big times. <laughs> anyway, if you read that quote, hopefully I can get it up somehow or other, uh, you'll see that, um, yeah, where does it go? I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but go to the first one. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right, yeah, well, yeah. 
Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So, as I explained to your grace at our interview, to discriminate against any citizen or to exercise a preference for a citizen on account of religious belief would be to conflict with some of the fundamental principles on which this state is founded. Now, I think that's a very clear statement, and you can read that in his letter to Archbishop Kim Martin. And I take that from the actual image of the letter that you'll see in uh, Michael Affen's book on uh, W.T. Cosgrove. He brought out a book not long ago full of pictures of the letters of, of W.T. Cosgrove, and you get that in it. And another example you could take from the, the, the Taoiseach ship of, um, of W.T. Cosgrove would be the very early point in it. I think it's 1923, um, the, uh, the Vatican sent down an emissary. <clears throat> he was going to sort of solve the civil war and bring both sides together, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It was uh, an envoy from the Vatican, a very senior uh, position, and uh, the Irish government effectively told him to get lost. If you look at the account of that, that's what happened. W. T. Cosgrove, the whole Irish government said, "No way are you having any role to play politically. Just mind your own business." And they, they went back to the Vatican and got a withdrawal. And I, I think that that's a fair description of, of that uh, industry. So that, that's W. T. Cosgrove. That's our first um, uh, Taoiseach, effectively. As I say, he didn't have the title, but he was. And that, that was his approach. Now we come to obviously Eamon de Valera. <coughs> the, I'm following each Taoiseach ship in, in succession, uh, who, who came in in 1932 and hardly ever went away. <laughs> anyway. <coughs> De Valera, I, I'm going to, you know, obviously it's a very long career and I'll be here forever talking about it, but I thought I would highlight uh, three things particularly in the long career of, of De Valera on this question. Uh, the first point, which people seem to forget, is that during the Civil War, uh, Eamon de Valera was excommunicated by the Catholic Church. People forget that. All the people who opposed the state during the Civil War were excommunicated. It's a very definitive statement by the Irish bishops. And here you see Dan Breen, uh, a well-known feat of all TD, uh, talking about it after, uh, in after years. He said the Civil War was bad, but it saved us this much. It saved us from government of Manilth. The people were split on the issue of the treaty, but the hierarchy went out and attacked the Republic, threw bell, book, and candle at it in nearly every pulpit in the country, and they drove one half of the people against them, with the result that they never regained the power they once had. Now, I think you can take from, you can see how important it was, the excommunication of the Republican side in the Civil War from that. And I think you can see the kind of resentment that went through that side of the Civil War all throughout. You know, they, they were never going to take, listen to Bishop Saul that much because they had been excommunicated back in the day, as I say, including De Valera. And the, and the one point that I, the one simple point I would make to you is that a lot of these people wrote their memoirs later. Dan Breen was one of the first. I mean, and you can obviously read them now in the witness statements in the National Archives, a huge collection. I'll put it to you, you will very rarely or never read an account in those witness statements that, that said that any Republican modified his views or his political actions because they were excommunicated by the church. If you read down through it, you, you know, that, that, doesn't, that never happens. You know, they, they just went on and did whatever they were going to do politically. They ignored uh, what the bishops did in, uh, in excommunicating them. Now, that being the case, that's definitive proof that they were not the type of people to modify their political activities just because the bishop said X or Y about them. If you think about it, that's definitively, you know, it explains that. So anyway, De Valera was one of those people excommunicated by the Catholic Church. It was not said by anybody that he did anything differently after he was excommunicated than before he was excommunicated. It didn't, no effect on his political uh, activities. So I, I thought that was an, an important point. Now, the second issue I wish to bring out on the question of De Valera, and it's one that you can't avoid, is the question of <clears throat> the Constitution. <clears throat> now, it's often been alleged, and this is the kind of the mythology of the thing, the, 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 that the Constitution was very heavily influenced by this man here, <clears throat> Dr. John Charles uh, McQuaid, and that he basically wrote it, blah, blah, blah. Now, the fact of the matter is that this is one, one area where a lot of research has gone into it uh, in recent years. You can, you can read many books in the last 10, 20 years on the making of the Irish Constitution. And in that, they absolutely are saying now, no, the Catholic Church, none of them had all that much influence in any part of the Constitution. Now, to, to clarify, he did consult a number of church figures. He consulted uh, uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Father Cahill, who was a Jesuit, he consulted Father Dennis Ka uh, Fahey. Now, <clears throat> Father Fahey was a priest of the Holy Ghost Order, as was Dr. McQuaid. And the Holy Ghost Order uh, ran Blackrock College. So if you, if you want to know about Eamon de Valera and his clerical links, 
uh, BlackRock College is the place uh, you want to focus in on. So th that's how he would have met Dennis Fahey, and that's how he knew uh, Dr. McQuaid. <clears throat> so he consulted them. Uh, and in the case of McQuaid, it's true that McQuaid had some influence on uh, a number of different areas to do with rights, I think family rights. It's sometimes claimed that the overall claim to the national territory might have been influenced by him. Uh, McQuaid came from Cav, not far from the border, and in an area where there's lots of Protestants and Catholics, and he kind of had a, a sort of northern Catholic flavor to him. Anyway, the point is that, you, 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 in, by the way, in the Constitution, you do have a preface that's clearly Christian. Now, I think, I think the source of that was, was elsewhere as well, rather than McQuaid, but definitely we do have a preface, it's still there. But when it comes to the religious clauses in the Constitution, uh, McQuaid and those two other priests had no influence at all on it, surprisingly. It, you see, so what happened was, it, McQuaid, de Valera had McQuaid going through all these different rights, like the rights of property, etc., etc. And even at one point, he sent uh, McQuaid a draft of the Constitution, and he left the, cl the religious clauses blank. It's quite interesting. And then, uh, at some point, McQuaid went to visit him. And there, and there he showed him the religious clause in the Constitution. And McQuaid was enraged. Uh, you know, and he had to apologize then a, a few days later. Uh, he was enraged. The Vatican was very unhappy. And Father uh, Cal and Father Dennis Fahey campaigned for about 10 or 20 years afterwards to try to get us what they would consider a Catholic constitution because they were so enraged with the constitution. The point is that the religious clauses that he came up with, De Valera, were one, he stated that the Catholic Church had a special position in Ireland. And that's it. And then he went on in the next clause to say that also we recognize the, the Church of Ireland, the Jewish faith, uh, Methodist, etc., etc. So this meant nothing. It, it just meant nothing. It seemed to, to, to put the Catholic Church in the same line as all these other religions, much to the annoyance even of the Vatican. So, <clears throat> so, so in fact, we didn't get a Catholic institution or a constitution. And, uh, and a lot of people complain bitterly about that. So that's, I, I just thought I needed to address, when I talk about De Valera and Rome rule, etc., we need to talk about the Constitution. And as I say, the modern thinking is it wasn't much influenced by the Catholic Church, at least uh, outside of some issues relating to rights and families and whatever, with, with, there was some influence there, but otherwise uh, not much. Now, the third issue I want to address uh, with respect to De Valera was to talk about those two guys again. So that's Dr. John Charles McQuay. Now again, he looms large when people are going to talk about Cath uh, the influence of the Catholic Church uh, in the independent Ireland. Dr. John Charles McQuay and this guy, uh, Michael Brown, <coughs> the, um, the Bishop of Galway and the, and the builder of the very fine cathedral that's in this city. Now those two figures, now if you were to talk about the modern mythology, if you like, of the Catholic Church supposedly dominating independent Ireland, those are the two people we're going to hear an awful lot about. Dr. John Charles McQuaid and, and uh, Michael Brown in Galway. Now, the point I was trying to bring out about this is, is this quote you can see in John Cooney's um, biography of John Charles McQuaid. Uh, in that, you can see that, in fact, uh, it seems that de Valera himself was responsible for the appointment of both people as bishops. You can see there where it says, his de Valera's proactive policy had helped secure the promotion of Benut Professor Michael Brown, known as Cross Michael to Galway in 1937, and the Derry priest Neil Farrell to Rafaux in early 1939. So that's de Valera's policy to get those appointed. Now de Valera instructed the Secretary of the Department of External Affairs, Joe Walsh, to inform the Vatican authorities of their uh, views. Walsh in turn instructed the head of the Irish legation to Holy See, uh, his former Congo's pupil, uh, William Babington Macaulay, to press the case from McQuaid, who was to be codenamed X in secret correspondence between Dublin and Rome. Now that correspondence, so the whole Megillah of de Valera's pushing to get McQuaid uh, appointed as Archbishop, went on for a very long time. And it was a very, it was massive amounts of lobbying by de Valera of Rome to get McQuaid appointed. He was definitely the man to appoint McQuaid to the Archbishop of Dublin. And as you can see, he seemed to be the same uh, role in appointing Michael Brown to Galway. Now, so I would like to put the question to you then. If it is the case that de Valera was the man responsible for appointing Michael Brown to Galway and McQuaid to Dublin, then surely you're not talking about the church dominating the state. You're talking about the state dominating the church, 
It's not the logical way to look at it. I mean, if, if, he, if he was responsible for appointing those guys, they, then that kind of blows the whole myth out of the water, that supposedly McQuaid you know, is the puppet master and De Valera is, the, you know, is his underling. When you look at that, you reckon it's the other way around. And I, and I think it was the other way around in many, many areas of, of Irish life. You will find Fianna Fáil and the government dominating some aspects of the church and indeed exploiting them realistically exploiting them. And by the way, it does come up a little bit in the tumor. There was a reference where um, the religious order uh, moved the, the head of the, of the tumor. I think it's about 1952. And in response, in, in I think it's Galway County Council, they were saying, oh, we'll have to get that reversed. We've got to get her appointed again or whatever. And it seemed to be that they expected to be able to manipulate the appointments within the religious orders. So that's an agenda that people are not talking about. The degree to which the state dominated the church in those years exploited them, but I think you could make quite a case about that. And I think that, that that's an evidence there in the question of De Valera and, the, and these appointments. So that's, that's just what I want to talk about De Valera, those, those three uh, issues there. Next you come along to uh, John A. Costello. So John A. Costello uh, was a famous barrister. Uh, he, uh, he famously he was on the opposite side to Patrick Kavanagh in a big court case. And he's, he's the only figure along here who really doesn't have a major role in the War of Independence in that period. He was just working as a barrister. It, it used to be said that in 1916 he came up to one of the checkpoints on his way to play golf. And uh, he was very annoyed that he couldn't play golf in 1916. Anyway, but, but he was uh, a very highly respected um, uh, Taoiseach of Ireland, uh, anyway, under the two inter-party governments. Uh, now let's have a look at uh, what they say about him. <clears throat> the, this is from the biography of John A. Costello, uh, come out that long ago, by uh, David McCullough. David McCullough, that's the, uh, the broadcaster, you, you'll see him on prime time uh, on RTE. <clears throat> and he's just describing there a visit, I presume that's a visit, from, by John A. Costello to uh, Rome. And I think in this case they're particularly referring to Trinity College. And you'll see there that later Costello met a senior Vatican official, Monsignor Domenico Tardini, the pro-secretary of state in charge of extraordinary affairs. Tardini pointed out that the Irish government accorded very favorable treatment to non-Catholics, which contrasted the way Catholics were persecuted in the North. And Costello explained to him, <coughs> explained that the government gave fair treatment to non-Catholics, both on general principles and also in the interest of future unity. Obviously, he's referring there to the Protestant majority in the North. But that tells you again, that's a quote very much like what W.T. Cosgrave, that was the policy of the government, fair treatment to non-Catholics. And, and I think, you know, the, the, that's a gen genuine statement. And as I say, I think it's particularly in reference to Trinity College. The Vatican was very interested in the kind of promotion of Trinity College by the Irish state. At that time, and up to 1970, Catholics couldn't even officially attend Trinity College. So you had to get a dispensation. Uh, so it was it has such a, a strong Protestant ethos. And yet, it appointed three TDs uh, to, to, the, uh, <clears throat> to the parliament up to 1937, and appointed three senators uh, from that time on and nowadays. So, so, and then, of course, as, as a university, it was subsidized by the state in many cases as well. So, so the Vatican couldn't understand why the Irish government would want to subsidize an institution that was so, so blatantly anti-Catholic. And that's what he had to explain there, that it was their policy to treat uh, non-Catholics uh, fairly. So that's, that's uh, Johnny Costello's next teacher. And obviously succeeding him <coughs> is uh, Sean Lamass. Uh, Sean, Sean Lamass um, ha had quite a role during the War of Independence and was famously Eamon de Valera's number two man <coughs> virtually throughout uh, in Fianna Fáil. Now, the Irish Times <coughs> published a supplement uh, a couple of years ago uh, giving his uh, memoirs. These are apparently tapes that were discovered not long ago and he gave some of his uh, thoughts on the tapes. And, and here, here, for example, is a quote from one of them. And I think there was political advantage in having a certain anti-clerical uh, tinge. The only time in my life that I ever got an enormous vote, the highest vote ever recorded to any candidate in a general election, was when I was having a full-scale row with the Bishop of Galway. And this was dominating the political scene. And I found this in other occasions too, that having a good row with the Bishop is quite a political asset and you're not suffering for politically for it because there's an anti-clericalism in the Irish people. So he had no problem in having a go at, at bishops. And in fact, he did it, it seems, deliberately for his political advantage. So this idea that the bishops are dominating the, uh, you know, uh, dominating the political class doesn't seem at all the case 
In fact, in many cases, the opposite. They, they, they'd make the bishops the fall guys, as, as he was doing there. And, he, and here's another quote from these memoirs. <clears throat> so, I do not remember having any difficulty, sense of strain, or problems in dealing with the church. My personal relationship with all the principal archbishops and the cardinal was always good. <clears throat> Whenever I wanted advice about anything, there was never the slightest suggestion that they felt it was their duty to impose any point of view upon us. I could have been lucky. Uh, nothing emerged in my time that would have raised a conflict. I can only testify on my personal experience in that regard. So he's saying definitively there in his memoirs, tape memoirs, uh, he, he, he died not all that long after he, after he was Taoiseach, that in fact it was not the case that the church in any way, shape, or form dominated the state. That's very clearly uh, what he's saying there. Now he's saying it's from his personal experience, but as well as being Taoiseach, as I say, he was number two to Devil Air from 1932 on. I mean, it, it's incredible what experience you're talking about. So somebody like him has 40, 50 years of that chunk of independent Ireland uh, to build on, and that was what he was stating was the case. So I thought, we'd, so there are the Taoiseachs. When you're past the La Masse, you're into Jack Lynch, and then you're into very modern time. So I think that kind of covers the period that people think we have some sort of Catholic dictatorship. So that, they were the Taoiseachs. And, and you could look at a few other institutions as well. These are the presidents of Ireland. I noticed that uh, two of the first presidents of Ireland um, were Protestant. Uh, as you can see there, Douglas Hyde and Erskine uh, Childers. And, and, like, and it was a significant statement for the Irish government to appoint Douglas Hyde to, to be the first president. I mean, it, it's, it's quite a noticeable thing. You know, and it, he, he then, uh, you know, when he was inaugurated, they held three religious ceremonies. One was in the Pro Cathedral, I think Eamon de Valera was at that. And then they had another uh, ceremony, I think simultaneously, in St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, which is, of course, the Church of Ireland. And Douglas Hyde uh, sat in the seat of the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, i.e. the Viceroy of Ireland. I mean, it's, it's very interesting, it's very significant that he would occupy you know, the same position as the old British Viceroy of Ireland. And of course, that's in the St. Patrick's Cathedral because it's the Church of Ireland. And then simultaneously, there was also a Jewish, Jewish ceremony held uh, while coming in the new president. So you can see from that, the degree to which the Irish government was very conscious of bringing along its minority faiths, and to, to what extent its minority faiths were given, you know, very much a hallowed place in Irish society. It's not remotely the case that they were bulldozed out of it, like some people claim is happening. So, and then another institution you could talk about is the judiciary. <coughs> so here's just a, a little quote from the, the DNB, or sorry, the, um, the Irish uh, biography, for the recent uh, Dictionary of Irish Biography, on Timothy Sullivan, who was the first president of the Irish High Court, and you can see his dates there, the 20s and 30s, and said, throughout his tenure, uh, Sullivan presided over a high court whose membership of six was equally divided between judges of nationalist and unionist background. So in fact, the judiciary at that time, that would be the first couple of decades, you have half the nationalists and half the unions, presumably then half, half Protestants. So I mean, that's obviously not an institution then dominated by the Catholic Church. And you could throw in a few names there, T.C. Kingsmill uh, Moore, on the Supreme Court and the High Court, uh, son of a Protestant minister, James Creed Meredith. Now they appointed him the president of the Dawes Supreme Court, 1920 to 22, meaning the underground uh, courts that they had founded. So it's very interesting that before independence, you know, the Irish, the Dáil underground system, he was appointed the head of as the president of that Supreme Court. And then he was on the High Court and um, the uh, Supreme Court, uh, and he's Protestant. And Gerald Fitzgibbon <coughs> was a judge of the Supreme Court. He was quite a very important and influential judge of the Supreme Court uh, from 1924 to 38. And he and the then Chief Justice used to, you know, be at loggerheads. A fellow called Kennedy was the Chief Justice. Uh, but, but he was very important, and actually, the Supreme Court of some, I think, rather surprising decisions in those years and a little later uh, in, in favour of Protestants in some, in some respects. So that's the judiciary, and here are just the law of areas of Dublin I thought people might be interested in. So for 1950, 60s, 57, 61, and 62, you had Robert Briscoe, who was the law of Mary Dublin, and, and 60 to 61, you had Morris Dockrell, who was Protestant, and Robert Briscoe was Jewish. And when, and when he took office in 1956, here's just a quote from him. In Ireland, at least, there was absolute tolerance. And in this Catholic country, a man of faith could have the goodwill of his citizens he did, if he deserved it and was prepared to give service to his fellow citizens. So that's his opinion as a Jewish person. 
In Ireland, 1956, there was absolute tolerance. And he was a senior figure in Fianna Fáil, he's a well-known figure in Fianna Fáil, and I think he was his son as well. And, and you know, so no problem uh, been either Fianna Fáil, uh, being Protestant or, or Jewish in this case, uh, and holding senior office in Ireland. Now, having moved away from just these institutions, the, the policies of the Taoiseach, which is obviously the most important thing in determining what was the policy in Ireland, and then looking at a few institutions, maybe it might be interesting to, to look at some of the different sectors <coughs> in terms of the policies. So here's just a quote about healthcare. Now, this was a proposal in 1959 to, to amalgamate some of the big Dublin hospitals into a voluntary hospital system. And they just list some of the hospitals. So Sir Patrick Stunn's, Mercer's, National, National Children's Hospital, Harcourt Street, Mead, Bagot Street, Stevens, and Adelaide. And some of the great names of Dublin hospitals, or not, not all of them, but some of the great names. Now, as he, as he points out there, I'll just read the quote, with the exception of the Mead, they could all be referred to as Protestant hospitals, controlled by Protestants and largely staffed by Protestant uh, doctors. So as you can see, that very impressive list of Dublin hospitals, and it's not all of the, of the Protestant Dublin hospitals, were totally dominated by the... You, you couldn't get in there if you were a Catholic, at least as a doctor. And, and that's as late as 1959. Now, how is that compatible with this idea that we lived in a Catholic dictatorship, blah, blah, blah? Obviously, they let the, the Protestants run their own system in, in the hospitals. Now, the other area to look at then is education. <clears throat> now, education is, is quite, a, quite a, an, an interesting subject, and I think become a, a little controversial subject uh, nowadays. So I think maybe it might help to talk about what is the policy and education as regards religion in Ireland in those years. And what you'll find, I would say, totally for independent Ireland of the 20th century, is that they follow an education policy determined in the 19th century. They, they left it unchanged. They came in, to, took office, uh, when the Irish state came in, and they never changed this policy. It's amazing. Now, why? Because it was a matter of great debate in the 19th century. It's a huge issue. You're talking 1820s, 30s, 40s, the bringing in of the national school system, and then in the 1840s, the Queen's Colleges. The national school system the first, would be first level, Queen's Colleges, third level. In both those cases, huge rows because the state was trying to impose a kind of a national state-run system in the national school system. The Catholic Church objected. You, it was a Protestant state after all. Uh, you know, you had the Church of Ireland was the official Protestant religion. They felt they were going to get kind of brainwashed by the state in this case, so massive objections. So, for example, the national school system in, in, the, in the Archdiocese of uh, Chum, up until the death of, um, of the dead Michael, the then Archbishop of Chum, there was no national schools permitted, except, by the way, in the, in the workhouse, our workhouse, because that was controlled by the state. But otherwise, he didn't permit any national schools. That shows you the kind of rows that were there. And of course, the Queen's Colleges, the Queen's Colleges are what, what is now NUIG, uh, Queen's University of Belfast, and, U, and UCC. And, uh, <clears throat> They were kind of Protestant institutions in the views of the Catholics, so a huge row, boycotting of them, blah, blah, blah. So the, 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 this came into a head in a, in a kind of a commission that the British government introduced about 1871, I think, called the Powers Commission. And, and, and the, now I'm not saying it was just their decisions, but in the few years after that, what evolved was a system whereby the British said to the Irish authorities, uh, to the Irish faiths, they said, okay, you, you build your, uh, your school, you have your college, whatever you want to do, and we'll just pay the teachers. And that's it. And you own it, and you control it, and you can put whatever class you want, you teach whatever religion you want. So if you're the Methodist school of Ireland, you set up a Methodist school for all your people, no problem, the state will pay the teachers. And, and of course, there is, there is a curriculum, uh, an interest cert and then a leaving cert, and of course, there's also uh, particular exams to get into universities. But apart from that, the state did not control the schools. They, they were owned and run and built by the religious orders uh, and managed by the religious orders, and of course still are. So that was the policy. In other words, the British government, you know, uh, flew up the white flag in education. It's absolutely fascinating. They just said to them, okay, look, you, you, you do what you want to do in these schools. We'll continue to pay the teachers. But you can put whatever you want, your history, your religion, and you, you can teach whatever you want. If you're the Christian brothers, you, you control uh, uh, that aspect of the curriculum. So, come the Irish state, they follow the same policy. Now, uh, so in other words, it's laissez-faire. You, you, you are whoever you are, whatever church you are, or, or, not, or not a church, as, as we can see later. You, you build your school, we'll, we'll pay the teachers. 
And it was just, it's just totally laissez for totally liberal policy, actually. And, and so the Irish government continued on that policy, right, uh, after independence. And, th and this is what led to the situation where, in Ireland, we are the first country, I think, in Western Europe, to have, um, a, have state, state paid teachers in a Muslim school. I think that's about 1990, in, in Klotsky. And, th and then about 1979, they set up the Educate Together schools, which would be kind of atheist schools, effectively. And all of them are paid, the teachers are paid by the Irish state, no problem at all. And then in about, I think it's 1930 something, you've got um, a Jewish national school set up in the south of the city. And after that, you've got a Jewish secondary school. All no problem, state pays the teachers. They can teach whatever they like, religion, etc. And of course, that's true of all the Protestant faiths. They have all their own schools, no, no issue whatsoever. So you can see there, this quote, I think this is a senator, an Irish senator speaking there from 1964. And he just pointed out that we in Ireland are justly proud of our school system. Uh, he continued, scrupulous care is taken to ensure that Catholicism, Protestantism or atheism are not imposed on any pupil against his will. Any denomination group can at any time set up its own school and the corresponding state support is immediately made available on the basis of the number of pupils in attendance. It's a totally lousy fair point. It's a very liberal policy. It's amazing. So that was the policy. Now, for those who don't know, it's totally different in, in most of the countries of Europe. The, the state imposes its policy. If you, if you talk about Spain under Franco, I mean, you, I, I think it's illegal to have uh, Protestant schools. I'm waffling so much. As we get. Anyway. Uh, so anyway, that's the education, and you can see in that, again, it's ridiculous nonsense to talk about Catholic dictatorship, it's the complete opposite. It's a very, it's a, it's a remarkably liberal and tolerant environment. Now I thought also I'd, I'd highlight an, other, another interesting issue. Now obviously, during this time, there was massive discrimination against Catholics north of the border. But uh, what I think a lot of people don't realise is that, you know, especially in employment and all that, as well in fact the Catholics couldn't get jobs, whatever. That was also, to quite a degree, true of the south of Ireland. And that's what people don't seem to understand. There was discrimination against Catholics, quite a lot of it, in the south of Ireland in, in those years. So there's Guinness, you've obviously heard of it. Uh, it was boasted about one of the biggest companies in the world in, in its day. And, and its day was still all 20th century Ireland. It's still a very big company, very big employer. And uh, it, they actively discriminated against Catholics. It's a well-known fact around Dublin. You know, and it was just a quote from the Irish Independent there. It, Guinness, had no qualms about selling drink to Catholics, but it did everything it could to avoid employing them until the 1960s. The blatant discrimination continued far longer than it should have. So you have up to the 1960s. Now that's 40 years after Irish independence. And I think it's probably the biggest company in Dublin is openly discriminating against Catholics. Now, how do you square that with this Catholic dictatorship stuff uh, that people go on about? Now, they did, here's another institution to give an example of anti-Catholic discrimination in South Ireland. That's the Rotunda. Now, uh, the, the Rotunda is um, probably the most prestigious of the, of the Dublin hospitals. It's founded in 1745, and it's still on the same site. And when they founded it, they found a system called Masters. I've forgotten how long a Master is. Maybe it's seven years or whatever that a Master is, is in charge of it. From 1745 until, okay, guess what date? Uh, there was no Catholic master. Does anybody want to hazard a guess? It's 1995. The first Catholic master of the Rotunda Hospital is not to 1995. Now I'll ask you, how can that be when you consider that in 1960s, I think it was, uh, the Irish, the Southern Irish state had 95% Catholics. It was 95% Catholic state. And that institution, an important and big institution, would have no Catholic master until 1995. You know, I find that amazing. Uh, and, it, and here is the Bank of Ireland, a similar story. Uh, the, the first, uh, and, and that was well known to be discriminated against Catholics. It's not, you know, that it's an accident. These people are all run, the higher managers are all run by Protestants. These are Protestant institutions, but very large, important institutions. It's so obviously, it's the Bank of Ireland's former uh, House of Lords building there in Dublin. Founded 1783. The first Catholic CEO of the Bank of Ireland is not to 1991. Long, you know, it's an amazing fact, I think. And uh, as Trinity College, the same story, founded 1592, the first Catholic, uh, what is the provost, I think you call him, uh, of Trinity, uh, not till 1991. So I think it's Tom Mitchell. Uh, so it's not remarkable. I mean, it's, it's incredible. All throughout the independent Irish states, nobody said to them, excuse me, you can't discriminate against Catholics. Because they did, obviously they did discriminate. And it's the Irish Times. 
founded 1859, and the first Catholic editor not till 1986. So I think when you look at those kind of institutions and you can see how they systematically excluded Catholics, again, you can see how much of a nonsense it is to talk about some kind of Catholic dictatorship. You know, uh, so that's uh, that, that, that's basically it. I don't know if I had a time or. Uh, so so uh, so I, so to summarize, uh, I think it's I think it's ridiculous to say that is you know home rule was wrong rule. It's not true. It's, it's Ian Paisley's version of events that it's, it's flat out not the case. And so uh, I'll hand you over now to Eugene George to talk about the tube story. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Brian. That was a very interesting talk. Um, a lot of stuff in there that I had come across before, so that's very good research and very well done. Uh, I think I'm going to take a completely different uh, view on it, or a different perspective on the whole thing. And while it's centred on Tum, really, historiography is what, I, what I'm going to show you, is that how it has failed, in particular in regard to Tum. There's an old maximum in history which goes that history is written by the victors. Accordingly, it is their point, written from their point of view, the motive is the justification for their actions and to vilify their foe. Such histories are never a true and impartial record of events. Moreover, political activists of all hues and creeds weaponize history and use it to attack their opponents. Historical truth in such battles is of little consequence. Moreover, the people can, con moreover, people can consciously bias history, but it also can be influenced accidentally through subconscious biases of the historian. Consequently, historians are trained in a number of strategies to get rid of the lies, mistakes, and biases from the historical narratives. Accordingly, falsehoods are nothing new and are so prevalent within the domain of history that quality historical writing requires that falsehoods be filtered out using quality control procedures. In history, historiography is the term given to this quality control method. It's what historians like to call the history of history. In effect, it is asking the questions, who wrote what? Is it a valid representation of historical events? Is there corroborating evidence from independent and diverse sources? And are the sources of the information authentic? Why is it necessary? Believe it or not, the human mind can make many knowledge, knowledge processing errors. Accordingly, all academic disciplines and all areas in the area of human intellectual endeavor have in place quality control methods to reduce the effects of these errors or cognitive biases to give them their technical term. These quality control mechanisms can fail from time to time. And it is the embarrassing failure of Irish historiography, which I will set out to investigate, which I set out to investigate a number of years ago, using this little word, why? Why has it failed? History can only stand as valid if it can withstand critical evaluation. The word critical literally means to find fault with something. I realize that the philosophy of arriving at historical truths is more than a bit academic or highfalutin. Moreover, as you all, all you need to know is that history is often weaponized. It is difficult to understand because a lot of the background information needs to be absorbed and that takes time. Accordingly, misunderstandings are common and experts are needed to raise awareness and expose the falsehoods. From this point forward, I am not going to mention the word histori historiography. Instead, I will attempt to explain it, how, uh, explain it, how it has failed and you, by using some practical examples. It requires us to take a journey a long way from Tune, with the express aim to expose the, the chief foundation stones upon which the false history surrounding the Tune children's home and the many other recent historical fallacies rest. I will attempt it as a quiz, but don't worry, I'm not going to ask you all questions individually. Here you go. See if you can recognize what links all these pioneering scientists together. And I'll just go through the slideshow now. This is one of my favorite people of all time, Lazaro Spallanzani. He was the first man to uh, use in vitro fertilization, or to come up with in vitro fertilization. In vitro means in the glass, not in utero, which is in the womb. Uh, so, and he was also a pioneer of Elo echolocation by bats. Eugenio Barsanti, he was the inventor of the first internal combustion engine. Giovanni Caselli, inventor of the fax machine. Now immediately you're thinking they're all Italian, uh, but just to fool you, here's a French person. 
Jean-Antoine Nollet, he discovered the osmosis in membranes. Have you heard of him? Giovanni Baptiste Venturi. Every mechanic has heard of the Venturi effect. It's used in carburetors. Uh, it's named after this man. He was also the first man to discover the scientific works of Leonardo da Vinci, and he published them in 1798. Up to that point, Leonardo was only known as an artist. So Venturi features prominently there. René Just Hoy was the father of crystallography. In science, he's regarded as the, the father of that. And here's the most famous scientist in the world that you've never heard of, Albert Einstein. No, it's the man beside him, Georges Lemaitre. He was the man who came up with the Big Bang Theory. Einstein was one of his biggest supporters, and here they are to pictured at a conference, a science conference. And this man, Gabriel Fallopio, the fallopian tubes are named after him. They carry his name. Now here's the big reveal. The big reveal? What connects them all together? They're all Catholic priests. How many feminists will be able to tell you that the female sexual organs are named after a Catholic priest? Now the reason I mention that, go back there. Almost every possible science publication, every popular science publication today, claims that the Catholic Church hated science. This has been repeated in a plethora of books, including A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. And its view was supported by atheist evangelists like Carl Sagan and his reincarnation, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and many more. It gets repeated on television programs over and over again, even by our own Irish educated physics graduate, Darrow Breen. It's not true, of course, and the evidence to support to transit is abundant, and it's a well-known falsehood within the community of science historians. O'Brien, Hawking, and others are simply repeating a common falsehood based on the prejudices of the society which they grew up in. It is an anti-Catholic falsehood, part of a much wider pantheon of myths commonly found in Protestant lands. However, O'Brien grew up in a Catholic society and received a Catholic education. Why is he repeating anti-Catholic prejudices? Why is he and many others unaware that they believe in myths? Why has their belief in, in science not led them to examine their beliefs using the scientific method? The answer is that they're all victims of the illusory truth effect, which oddly enough arises from scientific research and then scientific sport to the old maxim, when a lie is repeated often enough, it becomes to be believed as truth. Now before I go any further, you may think I'm defending the Catholic Church through criticizing the Protestant churches. However, as you, can, as you will see as we go on, the Anglican Church stands co-accused in the of murder and the abuse of infants in their care alleged to have happened through starvation in Ireland. I am in fact defending science and reason, I'm not defending uh, anything else. Here is a Daily Mirror st stating emphatically that children were starved to death in the Bethany home for unmarried mothers for children in Rathgar in Dublin. There is no hint that the claims might be allegations and that they were proven in a court of law. Move on. There it is, if you can see that on, on the camera. It says here, a care home where babies were starved to death and links to the most senior leaders of the Church of Ireland, the Irish Daily Mail can reveal. Starved to death, here is another headline. So if we zoom in on that, yeah, that's more or less saying the same thing. Not to leave uh, the, the Protestants on their own, of course the Daily Mail or some other paper I think there is saying that nuns starved, uh, babies were starved to death by nuns. Now, Victoria, Wright, Victoria White, writing in the Examiner, claims that the Protestant women who ran the home slaughtered babies. Slaughter them was the exact word which she used. There it is. There was slaughter, no less. Bethany, like Chum, was not exclusively a home for unmarried mothers. They were also used as refuges for women and their children. Such information has to be hidden from view. Has to be hidden from view. The Chum Children's Home is the name that was used in all the historical sources, but it has been falsely renamed the Chum Mother and Baby Homes in, in recent times to suit nefarious purposes. 
There is an old saying that if don't use your own mind, others will use it for you. As we progress forward, I hope to show you who are using those unused minds and those of the gullible. The foundation stone of false belief in Ireland can be traced back to the failures in the history curriculum in particular and the education system in general. However, when we look for the fundamental causes of these failures, it points to the existence of what scholars who study post-colonial societies call the colonial mentality. A colonial mentality is the internalized attitude of ethnic or cultural inferiority felt by people as a result of colonization. It corresponds with the belief that, that the cultural values of the colonizer are inherently superior to one's own. Think about that for a moment. There is ample evidence within Irish society to show that they think the British are superior and they will copy the Brits no matter what. Recently, while copying the Brits with regard to teacher assigned grades, the Irish copycats, two steps behind, managed to dodge a major bullet when the British system fell flat on its face, only to fall flat on their own face thanks to the Canadians. Can nobody in Ireland write a computer algorithm that can work out grades? So they have to turn to the Canadians. When the NHS, where is it? Oh. That. When the NHS has patients on trolleys, the HSE tries to, to have twice as many. Here we have patients in NHS hospitals on the floor when they ran out of trolleys. On the floor, hasn't happened in Ireland yet, but I'd say we're not far behind. Uh, why, why would they ever dream of copying the French, the Germans, the Swiss, or anybody apart from their colonial masters? They always copy the Brits. Not only does the colonial mentality include a belief in British superiority, its corollary is that of Irish inferiority. However, there's more to it. I will cite another example to illustrate this point. Here we have two ladies walking outside, number 56 St. Stephen's Green. It was the former home of the Earl of Meath and it was purchased in 1834 on behalf of the Sisters of Charity and turned into St. Vincent Hospital. Later, adjacent properties were purchased and to expand the hospital. Not many people know this, but Florence Nightingale applied to work with the sisters, not once, but twice, first in 1844, and she visited Dublin in 1852 to find a hospital closed for renovations. The reason she wanted to come to Ireland and work with the sisters was to learn nursing craft from the best nurses in the world. Her first mission to the Crimea was the result of a letter published in the Times of London written by a soldier complaining about the dirty and dingy hospitals the British had to, do, had to endure, while the French had clean and well-managed hospitals. In the very letter, he emphasized the point by saying, why have we no sisters of charity? As a result of that letter, Florence was dispatched to Scutari with a contingent of nurses, 14 Anglican nurses, 14 lay nurses, and 10 Catholic nurses who were also known, nuns. An Irish sister, you can see her circle there, uh, Mary Claire Moore was the chief executive officer of the mission. She managed to bring a level business head to counterbalance the more excitable Florence. Yet the British boast of how they invented good nursing practice through Florence Nightingale. At the end of her mission, the British establishment sought to organize event to boastfully celebrate her achievements. To her great credit, she avoided the ruckus and surreptitiously traveled back into England to avoid the self-aggrandizing bluster of her country people, dismissing it as false buzz. Why has the massive cont contribution of the Sisters of Charity been written out of history? The Sisters have over two centuries built a world-class hospital and provided the people of Dublin with free and affordable health care. Why are the Irish so ignorant that instead of celebrating the magnificent altruism and thanking the sisters, which would happen in any normal society, we've turned our back on them and pillory the good sister using falsehoods. Here we have the Sisters of Charity saving wounded men on the battlefield of Gettysburg in 1863. The answer, why would they believe in falsehoods? The answer to that is, it reveals a story which is emblematic of an overspill of British social engineering into Ireland, but it also fits well with Irish cultural biases. The British constantly boat of their greatness, taking credit which is not theirs to, to, to claim, to socially engineer 
contentment, or more appropriately, mitigates against discontentment within the population against this, against this establishment. It makes poor people accept their situation while keeping the elite in riches. Recently, the BBC Newsnight programme promised to reveal where the five poorest regions in Northern Europe are located. I was sure at least three of them would be in Ireland. But here, here's what they revealed. Shockingly, they were all in Britain. Every one of them. I couldn't believe it. Four in England and one in, Wales, one in Wales. The British social engineering was behind Brexit and it overspilled as much into the smaller higher exit movement. The one thing Ireland could do to mitigate against this overspill of social engineering is to educate its children properly, particularly with regard to history. However, such is the power, such is the power of social engineering that ignorance of history is much in evidence and is rife within the Irish political elite and government. The government have proven pretty stupid in matters historical in recent times. Take the apology to the wartime deserters of the Irish army as a good example. Britain, Canada, Australia, South Africa and more countries after the war all acted to ensure people who served their state loyally in times of, of a great crisis would have first call on public service jobs. In contrast to the, to the Irish government, the British government was never so stupid to apologise to the 100,000 people who deserted the British army during World War II. Neither has any other government acted so stupidly and apologised to the armed forces defenders. It's clear and unambiguous evidence of the Irish self-hate and it permeates all the way to the top. The commemoration of the centenary of the first all was ruled by comments by Taoiseach Leo Varadkar. He mentioned that the mother and baby homes setting them up as the primary failure of Dáil Éireann in its first 100 years of existence. Cato Connell TV stated in the Dáil Chambers that we murder children through abuse and neglect. This is our Holocaust, declared Councillor Cohor, Sinn Féin Councillor, sitting on Galway City Council at the time. Holocaust, no less. Now, peculiar thing in Ireland being Ireland, he was also a secondary school teacher in where else but the Jesuit College in Galway. The killing fields of Tune screamed the Derry Journal, and also the Sunday World. Killing fields, whoa. Excitable headlines sell newspapers. But one has to ask, why in historical debate, debate are there no historians? When the Tune story broke in 2014, a Dutch TV crew flew to Ireland, and out of all our historians in all of the country, they could only find Dermot Ferreter. In the interview, Ferreter gave many big hints but revealed nothing of, sub of substance, but was emphatic on one point. He was certain that the children were not buried in a septic tank in Tune. Claire Byrne on RT asked him only last year, was he still certain of this? And he replied, I am not sure. Where were all the rest of the historians? Any historical debate, there are historians on either side. Why in this particular debate is there no one? There's only one or two academic historians. I considered waging in on the deserters controversy, but that would have been a waste of breath, as the clowns had already taken over the circus. It was a fait accompli. The sheer amount of work which would have been necessary to get the truth across massively outweighed any benefit which might accrue. This could also account for the dearth of historians in the mother and baby homes debate. But I also surmise there is a lack of specialist knowledge within the Irish academic history. There appears to be very few, if any, historians trained in the history of science, the history of medicine, or statistical analysis. I've made a couple of important points here, which are the foundation of my thesis, and at this point I want to state them for reasons of clarity. The present day prejudices have deep roots that go back far, time, far in time. As Charlotte, Charlotte Bronte eloquently puts it, prejudices, it is well known, are most difficult to eradicate from the heart whose soil has never been loosened or fertilized by education. They grow firm there, firm as weeds among the stones. There you have it, education is a weed killer. Education protects people from the effects of ignorance, but that protection has been withheld from the Irish people. The government toned down the teaching of history in the 1980s because it feared that it was driving people to enlist in the IRA. The law of unintended consequences has since taken over, with the result that young people today are almost 
ignorant of the history of their own people. Into the mix are cultural prejudices. Begrudgery is perhaps the best known Irish cultural prejudice in Ireland. However, just one, it's just one prejudice representing the tip of the iceberg. Begrudgery, as the name suggests, is where people envy the success of others. It is a way of cutting down, putting other people down, which is done to create a feeling of superiority. It has the net effect psychologically of placing them beneath your social level. It's a form of social pretentiousness. The pretended that pretentiousness, that means pretending to be something one isn't. It's a common behaviour observable in all societies, but it's especially acute in Irish society due to the ancestral history of poverty and the non-existent social mobility. If you hate the Irish and all things Irish, and you are Irish, it's a form of self-hate. Michael McDowell famously labelled Fintan O'Toole as a self-hater, the journalist, because of the many articles he wrote attacking the Irish nation. O'Toole replied with his typical egocentricity, saying that he not only did he not hate himself, but he loved himself and loved himself dearly. Every day in the Irish media you can witness the Irish attacking themselves. It's a deep inset bias born in begrudgery, a manif manifestation of the pretentiousness of one's ancestors. It's an action which makes people feel big without ever having to achieve any social, real social advancement. The Irish self-hate is built into the terms of reference for the commission of investigation into the mother and baby homes. They are prevented from, from comparing the brutal system of care for unmarried mothers under the British, which was replaced with infinitely more benevolent system when the workhouses were got rid of in 1922, post-1922. Denigrating people living, living people outside of politicians is a very precarious endeavour, especially in this present-day litigious society. So deep is our need for illusory social advancement that the Irish have had to go back in time to denigrate the dead. When slandering the dead, one is unlikely to, to end up to end up in a court accused of defamation. It fulfills a need for small people to feel big. This is how significant numbers of the Irish population have behaved for century, centuries and continues today. And in spite of the advancement in education and attainment, this explanation might go some way to answering three big questions of observers of 21st century Irish society. Why do people want to believe in information which is obviously false? Why do people create falsehoods What's in it for them? Why have the Irish nation of the 21st century gone back and picked a fight with the dead? There has been a decline in former religions throughout Europe in recent decades, and Ireland has not been immune. The church was seen earlier by Irish societies as necessary for long-term salvation and was protected accordingly by society. However, it is now seen as a paragon of Irishness and accordingly it has been inducted into the Irish institution of self-hate. It is again a result of a major failure within the education system. Religion for a lot of people today is seen as backward and evil. Many people accept these false notions without question and they give them the because it gives them the feeling of social superiority. Accordingly, they are difficult to displace. False notions which have the beguiling power to increase one's own image of social standing and self-worth, which can be achieved with no effort, are difficult to resist for some people. Over only 7% of all the wars in history had religion as their cause. 93% had secular causes, yet secularism is not under attack. Because many people hold the false belief that religion was the cause of most wars. One of my daughter's science teachers at St. Andrews College in Galway told the class that there was no scientific evidence for the existence of God. I don't think the subject of the existence of God was actually on the curriculum, so he's expressing a personal opinion to the class. It demonstrates that many people know little about the fundamentals of science, and that includes many science teachers. The lack of ability, that lack of ability translates into a poor public understanding of basic statistics and medical terminology. Would you believe the ESRI in a survey found that 10% of Irish people did not understand what a percentage was? That means one in ten of you have no idea what I just said. The lack of mathematical understanding is, more, more, is one more foundation stone of the false history. For example, just take this hypothetical. 
Say University College Hospital in Galway has more people suffering from cardiac problems than the Galway Clinic. More people die in there than do in the private Galway Clinic. If you had cardiac problems, which hospital would you choose based on the statistics? I think most of you would be inclined to go to the Galway Clinic. We have a natural tendency to equate higher mortality rates with poor care. Did you know that 50% of doctors qualified in their final exams with marks which were below the class average? Imagine that. Maybe these people got, got all the jobs in the hospitals with the high mortality rates. It's an assumption which we use naturally. But it's not only wrong, but dead wrong. Don't tell that to the public. and Keep it from the journalists. Because they will not be able to make a living, make enough false stories through the misinterpretation of statistics. A hospital with a high mortality rate for cardiac problems has a specialist cardiac unit. Very six patients are sent to it, usually in a big hurry. If they die, their death is registered at the specialist unit, not the hospital which first admitted them. A high mortality rate is an indication of nothing. All hospitals which deal with high-risk patients have higher mortality rates. There is nothing untoward in that statistic. If 50% of doctors finished below the class average, the other 50% finished above the class average. That's what average is. It's a central, central, a measure of central tendency. Yet, how often is, it, is the phrase above average and below average used to manipulate opinions? Many people don't, aren't aware of it. Anyway, let's move on. Sorry, I'm doing my mind the wrong, but... Okay. So what is the reality when we look at mortality statistics? Here we have one here, and note the top two. The old people are, are fairly well represented there. Uh, about 500,000 in each category, from 65 to 74 and 75 up. So we add those together, it's a million. How about the deaths of children under five, which I've deliberately blanked out here. What would you say is the number of children? Well, I'll reveal it now. Two million. In an earlier time, young children died, much more young children died than even the whole rest of the population. Children, uh, young babies, particularly infants, are so subject to uh, higher rates of mortality, and that has been the case up until the 1960s in most countries in the world. Here is a statistic which was a graph that was produced by the CSO to commemorate 1916, and it shows the differences. Look at the differences under one. The green is, current, is 2014, and the purple represents 1916. You can see there in the one to four category, nobody died. There's not, maybe there's one or two, but in those, which was, but if we need to compare it with the past, it's the deaths under five is the way it was recorded. So I'll take that and I'll, I'll put it up here. Okay. Now you can see the comparison. Nearly as many children died under the age of five as died in the, the as died in 2014 in the 65 to 74 year, and even in the 75 to 84. All people you would expect to die, but they were vastly outnumbered. The high infant mortality rate was noticed all over the world. There was very little they could do with it at certain times. This is one from New York. Mothers, there is a way to stop the awful death rate among children in the crowded residence parts of the city. Children were dying all over the place. Here's another one from London. In London in 1911, 3,000 babies died in a month. In Paris, they were dying at the rate of 250 a week, a third of it. What was the cause? Very simple. What has been the biggest killer of children in history? And it continues to kill thousands of children, hundreds of thousands of children today. It was, of course, the baby's bottle. Children who have no mothers to feed them and are reliant on the bottle, there's lack of nutrition and there was a whole lot of other things. And you see, during hot weather, it was very difficult to preserve milk. And the milk would go off and uh, become poisons almost very quickly. And that was the simple fact that was what was killing a lot of children. On top of that, infants face even more danger from social conditions like poverty. The conditions of poverty which once existed in, in parts of Ireland still exist in parts of the world today. And it comes as no surprise to any competent social researcher that high infant mortality rates are associated with poverty. And that can be found 
in the richest country in the world. Here you have a headline from Newsweek. Washington's poorest infants are 10 times more likely to die than the richest. The primary evidence put forward as of abuse and starvation is the appearance of the word marasmus. Now you can see it underlined there, marasmatic. This is again Victoria White writing in the same article in the uh, Irish Examiner. It has been repeated many times, including in the Guardian and all the rest of it. Marasmus is the chief, found on, on, on uh, death certificates, is what the chiefly accused, used to accuse the, the nuns and the Protestant women of murder. Now here we have an extract from the Re Registrar General's report for 1919. You can see here what the medical profession think Marasmus is, as opposed to what Victoria White and others think it is. It's a developmental and wasting disease, and the three of them are there. Atrophy, debility, and marasmus. However, the significance uh, of marasmus as a killer of infants is, uh, however, this is significant. Marasmus was a killer of infants in maternity hospitals outside of mother and baby homes. Here is a certificate of, and I think there's a circle to go around there. Here is a certificate with marasmus on it. And it's from the Adelaide Protestant Hospital, as you'll notice there. So the Adelaide uh, Hospital, which is a Protestant hospital, mentioned by, by you earlier, it's now amalgamated into Tala Hospital. But here's evidence of murder, slaughter, at the Adelaide Hospital. Let's move on. Here we have Marasmus again. This time, it's at Temple Street Hospital. Temple Street Children's Hospital. Murder taking place there. Here we have another case of marasmus, which was actually a child died at home and has been certified by a medical profession. Not the use of the word certified. That means a doctor has visited the home and has certified that the child has suffered from marasmus and subsequently when it died, it was certified as having died as marasmus. Here is the famous Rotunda Hospital. Two cases of murder there as well. Now, if the journalists are going to use marasmus as a, a basis for jumping to the conclusion, that the nuns and everybody else murder children. Well, then they're going to have to go and accuse everybody in all maternity hospitals and all maternity homes because there are cases of marasmus in every single one of them. Now, why is it that the great professor, Dermot Ferreter, and the likes of them did not go and do any research and find this out? I did this sitting on my bum because it's available online. And they didn't even bother to go and look at that. And that's one of the prime problems we hear, a major failure of the quality control mechanisms within history. That none of the historians, who were highly paid, got off their bum and went to look for evidence to support or disconfirm the, the claims that were being made in the public domain. Now here's one, where, uh, if you came across this one. Here is an advertisement for the cure of marasmus. Now, if Erasmus is starvation, as they're trying to make out, why is there a cure for it? Surely it's food, or adequate food. The, the story is that it wasn't. This one here is an inquest uh, that was done on an old child. Now, I've got this, and it's not very good, so I'll overread it here. So this is an important one. The jury have found death from Erasmus was the verdict returned at an inquest held at St. Patrick's Stone Hospital on the body of a child named Donnelly, nine months old, off Thorncastle Street, Rings End. The coroner said, in consequence of the condition of the child, then it, when it was brought to the hospital, the surgeon was of the opinion that it died from starvation. But the post-mortem showed that death was due to natural causes. The child had been under treatment for six months, from July to January, in the children's hospital in Harcourt Street, and had not seemed to improve, and had to be treated by Dr. Crichton. Dr. Hogan, the house surgeon, stated that it was due to marasmus. The child not being able to assimilate nourishment given to it. The jury found in accordance with the evidence. So instead of starvation being recorded on the death certificate, what's recorded? Marasmus. By the way, an inquest is a coroner's inquiry. All unexplained deaths have to go through, go to the coroner, and the coroner sets up a court, if necessary, to get a jury to determine the cause of death. So this was determined by a jury, not by anybody else. Unexplained deaths all have to be reported to the coroner. 
Such failures are not reasoned in Irish academia. It has been failing for decades. The situation has become so bad that even young academics believe in the falsehoods and broadcast false history to their students and to the world. Here's an article written by Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley, published in 2016 by the Jacobean, an American left-wing magazine. Dr. Buckley works as a lecturer here in Galway at the university's Department of History. In this article, this article is notable for many elementary errors and is a classic of the genre of weaponized history. As you can see there, the Catholic cure for poverty. As I said earlier, the Protestant Church in Ireland stands co-accused of abuse and murder, while other Protestant dominated countries, dominated countries also operated mother and baby homes. The singling out of Catholics in the title should ring warning bells in the minds of historiographers that this article is not attempting impartial history. The, ex the experts should be able to spot problems right away. But what chance of the common people? They will surely be influenced by the author's credentials and place of work which are displayed at the bottom of the article. I will pick out two bold claims within the article and put them to the test. In my book, I go through this in more detail. But she says, women were banned from sitting on juries. That's the exact quote from the article. What was the reality? The Juries Act Amendment 1924. Every woman, oh, this section applies, is qualified and liable to serve as a juror on an administrative county or county borough, shall be entitled, if she so desires, to be entered into the register of electors for the registration shall to be entered in the registration of electors for the registration area comprising such a municipal county borough as exempt. So she could write in and say to the, the registrar, I want to be exempt from duty jury. That's not a ban. It was amended a few years later because obviously they were sending out jury summonses to a lot of women and a lot of them were saying, oh, I don't want to serve on it. You know, be gone. So the, it was the Juries Act of 1927. Persons exempted but entitled, entitled to serve on application were women on the basis of their sex alone. Women could apply to sit, to, they were entitled to sit on it and they could apply. So instead of being opted in, sorry, instead of opting out, now they had to opt in if they wanted to do it. And that was just a cut down on paperwork. But Sarah Buckley tells us they were banned. They were never banned. That's a lie. And she's not, she's not making that lie up herself. She's repeating it from other people. Uh, it's been going around for decades. And there's one other uh, example I want to give you. Women were prevented from occupations unsuited to their sex. Are they? That's what she says, emphatically. Women were prevented from occupations suited to their sex. That's a common canard that's in, in, in Ireland. Let's see what the Constitution actually says. The state shall endeavour to ensure the strength and health of workers Men, women, and tender age of children shall not be abused, and that the citizens shall not be forced by economic necessity to enter avocations unsuited to their sex, age, or strength. Why is only women singled out? Were men not banned from doing work unsuited to their sex? It doesn't say anything about it. It says forced by economic necessity. That's not making preventing women from uh, occupations unsuited to their sex. Article 41.2 is another one which the feminists uh, uh, presently don't like. The state shall therefore endeavour to ensure that mothers shall, be, and shall not be obliged by economic necessity to engage in labour to the neglect of their duties in the home. Now the feminists don't particularly like that, that one. The latter clause about women being... Uh, let me see. There you have it. Not only is misogyny not present, but misandry also, if you want to interpret it that way, is hatred of men. Of course it's not true, and this falsehood has been used up to prop up many major falsehoods that Irish society was misogynist. It hated women. If anything, the society, the, the society was phylogynist. It loved women, and it sought to protect them. That can be clearly seen in the Constitution and elsewhere. Anyone can make a mistake, and it is clear that due to her inexperience, this historian has simply repeating false history which should have been discarded decades ago and would not have had, it would not have been there if Irish academia had a functioning quality control system. Also, there is a fear within, within the system 
Historiographers fear to challenge feminist historians. Life is just too short, and there's no chance of reason prevailing over an emotional diatribe. The latter clause about women being forced to work outside the home has become the subject of feminist ire in recent years, but it has been of great benefit to the nation. My wife decided to stay at home and become a full-time mother. I got her tax-free allowance. Charlie McCreevy, the Minister of Finance, was forced by this clause to bring in an extra tax-free allowance for families, which I benefited from. Women today are forced to work outside the home through economic necessity, whether they want to or not, due to the high rents and property prices. If people were clever, they could use this clause to force the government to provide affordable housing. Finally, I would finish on this story. Some decades ago, a woman wrote to the Prime Minister asking him for permission to have her profoundly disabled son killed off. She even referred to him in the letter as the little monster. On receiving the letter, the Prime Minister called in his personal doctor and asked for his opinion. The doctor advised that the child should be put to death and that all disabled people in the care homes were a burden on the state and they should be killed off too. So began the mass killing of disabled people in care homes. The program was known as Action T4 and the doctor was named Carl Brandt who was later executed for this crime at the Nuremberg trials. The Prime Minister, I call it Prime Minister, just to put you off, was Adolf Hitler. And the T4 referred to the number of building where his office was located, number four, Tiergartenstrasse. Eventually word got round of the killings in the care homes, and while everyone was afraid to speak out, the Catholic Bishop of Munster, Clement August Graf von Gallen, bravely denounced Hitler from the pulpit. It caused such uproar that Hitler backed down and the Action T program in K T4 program in care homes was ended. Hitler effectively got a belt of a Catholic crozier. The ban of euthanasia is a fundamental principle of Catholicism. I want to leave you with this one final thought. Any woman, any man, doctors, nurses, nuns, politicians, etc., who are running a baby slaughtering service in Ireland, there is no doubt about it whatsoever they too, like Adolf Hitler, would have got a belt of a Catholic crozier. Thank you very much. Did you feel the meter, Rory? Hello, my name is Rory Connor. I see I'm described in the program as an expert in the various commissions and inquiries, but I would simply describe myself as an amateur historian with a special interest in the history of the Catholic Church in, in Ireland in the 20th century. Um, my main topic over the years has been false allegations of child abuse against the Catholic Church, including homicide. And I will actually be repeating some points made by the previous speaker, Eugene Jordan, about Jume. Uh, I concentrated over the years on false claims that Catholic religious killed children in their care because this is something that can be proven. It can be proven false even 50 years later. If a person is accused of abusing a child 50 years ago, um, he normally can't prove he didn't do it. But when Christian brothers or sisters of mercy are accused of killing children, then it is possible to prove that this is a lie. So that is why for the past 20 years I've specialized in that topic. Some of the child killing claims relate to periods when no child died of any cause. So I coined the phrases murder of the undead and also victimless murders to describe them. Now, if you like to Google the phrase murder of the undead, or the phrase victimless murders, uh, you should uh, come up with some of my material and some of the uh, controversies and debates I've, made, I've been engaged in. All of these crazy claims relate to the Christian brothers, that's uh, the murder of the dead ones, who seem to be the main scapegoats. However, the first child killing claim was made in 1997 and it was directed against the Sisters of Mercy and it related to the death of a real child, Marion Howe, 
from Golden Bridge Orphanage, who died in St. Dalton's Hospital in 1955. And as an example, there was an article in the Daily Mirror on the 11th of October 1997, uh, a rather long heading. The heading was, <coughs> Hot Poker Was Used on Little Marion. No cash will get her back. I think my baby was murdered at, at the orphanage, says Payout Mom. And it was the editor of the Irish edition of the uh, Mirror who wrote that. This type of, of hysteria was only starting at the time, that's 1997, and the accusers needed some kind of, of plausible claim, so they choose a real child who actually died. But that was only at the beginning. Uh, the last major child killing witch hunt was in 2009. It related to the unsolved murder of a young girl, Bernadette Connolly, in 1970. That's 40 years before. The hysteria was winding down at that stage. So again, I think the death of a real child was needed. Um, but in between, say between 1997, the 1997 blood libel and the 2009 one, there was an anything goes atmosphere. The media, journalists, broadcasters seemed to think they could say what they liked and nobody would contradict them. That's why we got the, the murder of the undead and the victimless murder claims during that period of just over a decade. Uh, where they were all directed against the Christian brothers uh, and they were accused of killing non-existent boys. Of course, the tomb babies were real children, like baby Marion Ho, and their deaths are, are being exploited also in the same way. So at first, I only intended to mention the tomb home as an aside because it seemed to be uh, slightly different from my main topic, that's the uh, concerns the Christian brothers and the allegations against them. However, I have posted some articles in my blog recently concerning Tume, and I see that there, there are similarities, more so than I would have thought. Uh, my blog is irishsalem.blogspot.com. Now, Irish Salem as in the Salem Witch Hunt, that's S-A-L-E-M. So this is... So the, the following is from an article from, by Brendan O'Neill, the editor of Spiked, the internet magazine Spiked. He's an Irishman and an atheist, but he doesn't take any nonsense. He wrote a couple of years ago that a hysterical piece in the Irish Independent compared the tomb home to the Nazi Holocaust, uh, Rwanda and Srebrenica, saying that in all these cases, people were killed because they were scum. Now, Srebrenica was, um, uh, it was a massacre of 8,000 Bosnians during the Yugoslav Civil War, I think it was about 1995. So that's what the Jew home was being compared to, and of course it was being compared to the Holocaust as well. So the heading of the actual article is, Jew babies cry not for justice but for vengeance. And it appeared in the Sunday Independent, Imro Kelly, on the 8th of June 2014. And it begins, 70 years ago, on the orders of a maniac, Little children and babies were herded into barren camps in Germany and occupied Poland by men in black uniforms. They were starved to death in those camps. Sometimes they had hideous medical experiments carried out upon them while alive. So hideous, the silence of death was properly merciful. And when they died, their little bodies were thrown into huge pits because they were scum. Jewish scum. Um, I'm skipping a lot now, and at the end she says, only one person, independent TD, Catherine Murphy, 
has pointed out that if this grim and ghastly discovery had been made anywhere other than in a ground relation to a Catholic institution, it would be fenced off as a crime scene. She seems to think that the Gardaí are giving special treatment to the Bon Secours nuns because they're Catholic, whereas the opposite would be more close to the truth. Um, there was also a headline in the Connacht Tribune on the 10th of March 2017, uh, Tune Baby's Investigation Likened to Nazi War Crimes Trial. And it starts, Junior Minister John Halligan has released a statement in which he says, old age should not diminish accountability in the Tune Mother and Baby Home scandal. He's calling on Gardaí to question any surviving Bon Secours nuns who ever worked in the home to establish whether a criminal investigation is warranted. He says, this is John Halligan, uh, as was the case with, with the Nazi war crimes trials, if an individual has been an accessory to a crime, then they should be held accountable regardless of how many years have passed. So again, as was the case with the Nazi war crimes trials, uh, the Bonsecour nuns are being compared to Nazis. Now, it wasn't just anti-clerical journalists and politicians either. Father Brian Darcy had an article in the Sunday World in June 2014, headed, Father Brian, baby graves are our greatest crime. So when I first heard the news that more, this is Father uh, Brian Darcy, when I first heard the news that more than 800 babies were buried in what was formerly a septic tank, I was astonished because initially I thought it happened in some famine-stricken country today. Then I thought I was hearing about Nazi Germany, etc. So, so back to the Nazis again. So I wonder, what has John Halligan and Demer O'Kelly got in common with Father Brian Darcy? Well, for one thing, they're all progressives. Like I would see myself as a conservative myself, or some might say a reactionary, but I try not to throw around phrases like Gulag Archipelago or Stalinism or Pol Pot just because I disagree, I have an ideological disagreement with somebody. You don't sort of, I think you shouldn't just toss around phrases like Gulag and Auschwitz and, uh, and Holocaust because you, de you devalue them as well as insulting your opponents, you're devaluing what actually happened in those um, terrible atrocities. But anyway, um, I've probably said more about Tume itself than, than I intend. I've only started to write about Tume fairly recently. But my main topic, I started this campaign actually on the 25th of September, 1999. The date the Irish Times published an article by Patsy McGarry, he quoted a leading member of Survivors of Child Abuse Ireland, who claimed he had attended the funerals of boys in Artain who died after being punched in the stomach by a Christian brother. But no boy died of any cause while this chap was in Artain. Um, so the Christian brothers obviously had something to say about that, and I suppose it was their reply, this was over 20 years ago now, that started me in my present course. Um, so uh, Brother J. K. Milan, province leader, wrote in a letter published in the Irish Times, 9th of October 1999, Sir, the Christian brothers note with deep regret and disbelief the seriously misleading article by Patsy McGarry our teen boys face the music and straps, the Irish Times, September 25th. The main source for the story seems to be Mr. Patrick Walsh, a former resident of our teen industrial school. Mr. McGarry made no attempt to check his story with the Christian brothers. Um, the article refers to boys arriving at the infirmary, clutching their stomachs after being punched by Christian brothers. In this context, Patrick Walsh is quoted as saying that he recalled two funerals of boys who had been rushed to the Matter Hospital with acute appendicitis, and that's an inverted commas, acute appendicitis. It is outrageous that an award-winning journalist 
should include such extremely serious assertions in an article in the Irish Times without even bothering to check the facts. The implication is that the boys who were beaten and seriously injured by the brothers were then dispatched to hospital where they died. The use of quotation marks around the words acute appendicitis seems to imply that the boys died from some other cause. The fact of the matter is that no boy resident in Artane died while Patrick Walsh was there. Now, um, there's more, but it's about a relatively minor issue. So there was a response by the Irish Times editor, but the only, only one sentence of the response related to this claim about boys being killed. In 9th of October 1999, a procedural oversight result occurred, as a result of which Mr. Walsh's allegations were not put to the Christian Brothers in advance of publication. And that's absolutely the only explanation the editor of the Irish Times, sorry, I've forgotten his name at the time, um, the only explanation he gave for, for publishing an article like that, and I'll just repeat it again, a procedural oversight occurred as a result of which Mr. Walsh's allegations were not put to Christian Brothers in advance of publication. Um, the Irish Times also published um, a follow-up letter from um, uh, uh, Mick Waters. Uh, he's, he's a member of the uh, uh, Society of Child Abuse Victims in the UK. But he supported the original allegation, but he, he didn't say anything uh, the names of the boys or really give any um, evidence in support of it. So that was actually what started me off more than 20 years ago. The um, allegation uh, of child, basically the children were killed by the Christian Brothers and then the, the um, Irish Times editor giving a, a one sentence apology that he regretted he hadn't uh, checked it with the Christian Brothers. He hadn't checked the no boy died. Um, so that is that. That was in September, 25th of September 1999 that I started my present crusade, I suppose. But in October 1999, TV3 broadcast a programme produced by Louis Lenton called Our Boys. It's a kind of a sneer. The Christian Brothers had a magazine called Our Boys, so it's kind of a sneer at that. Um, it quoted a leading member of, of the victims group, the Alliance for Healing of Institutional Abuse, Jerry Kelly, who claimed to have attended the funerals of boys who died in Artane. Again, no boy died of any cause when Jerry Kelly was in Artane. So again, all of that was done. The Christian Brothers um, had an article, or sorry, a letter in the Irish Times on the 25th of November 2000. Actually, the letter was after TV3 re repeated the programme a year later. So the letter was uh, in response to the repeated programme. Um, this letter is from uh, Brother J.K. Mullan, again, Providence Leader of the Christian Brothers. At Coron, on Sunday, November the 12th, that's 2000, TV3 broadcast a one-hour documentary entitled Stolen Lives, Our Boys, which had first been shown on the station in October 1999. The programme repeated a number of serious allegations against members of the Christian Brothers by former pupils of industrial schools. One particular past pupil claimed that he had attended the funerals of boys who had died while in Artane. It was further implied that these boys had died following beatings administered by the brothers. This allegation is completely untrue. The, the records show that no boy died in Artain during this person's time there. This is a matter of verifiable fact. You would think maybe that the TV3 were making a program about the same boy that was uh, the Irish Times wrote about it, but in fact it's two different boys who were in Artain at two different times and both claiming to have uh, attended funerals of boys, uh, boys who have been killed by the brothers but no boy died at the time. But they're two completely different uh, boys and two completely different allegations. So the, the letter goes on, uh, in, a, in the letter from the Christian brothers, 
In addition, this same past pupil claimed that a particular brother who allegedly had been abusing him made certain lewd comments during mass, as a result of which the pupil fainted and had to be transferred to the infirmary. Versions of this story have been repeated elsewhere to the extent that the brother is easily identifiable. However, the record shows that the brother was not teaching an Artane at the time in question. This is also a matter of verifiable fact. So, um, at least again, it's, it's, uh, it's been an unusual case where, where um, an allegation can be shown clearly, even decades later, an allegation can be shown clearly to be false. This was a lesser one, but the brother wasn't there at the time this is supposed to have happened. Um, Oh yes, and a few weeks before TV3 first broadcast Our Boys in 1999, they had been forced to broadcast an apology for libeling the Bishop of Cloyne. Well, that libel, obviously, it was more normal. It didn't involve any allegations of killing a child, a much, much lesser claim. But it's possible they, they broadcast the more serious um, allegation later as an act of defiance. They were showing, okay, we were forced to apologize to the bishop, but we were going to show we're not intimidated by the church. So, so they produced the far more serious allegation against the Christian brothers a few weeks later. So um, those were, I suppose, the two main cases that start me off and my campaign that's called Crusade, I suppose I might as well call it, it's been going on for 20 years now. But anyway, about the year 2000, and again in 2001, I went to the Gardaí about the Irish Times child killing claims, and also the TV3 one. I felt they were in breach of the Prohibition of Incitement to Hatred Act 1989. The Gardaí were quite sympathetic, but the Director of Public Prosecutions declined to prosecute. So they don't tell you why they declined to prosecute, but I got the impression that the DPP felt that the behaviour of the Irish Times and TV3 didn't prove they were motivated by religious hatred. So again, it's a question of trying to prove. Um, but anyway, last year, the Minister for Justice and Equality, Charlie Flanagan, pr proposed a new hate speech, a new improved hate speech law to improve on the old one. But unfortunately, I'm, I'm sure it, will not, it, it isn't designed to target blood, li blood libels against the Catholic Church. It's designed for other reasons. So following on, I made, uh, went to the Gardaí twice in relation to the Irish Times and TV trade, but nothing doing so. In 2004, I went to the Irish Human Rights Commission to ask them to organise an investigation into the child murder claims against the Christian brothers. At the time, I had forgotten the one against the Sisters of Mercy, so I didn't mention it. There, um, I'm not sure how, how it's possible to forget an allegation that a nun had killed a baby by using a hot poker to burn it. But, uh, the, the amount of false allegations is so incredible and so grotesque, yeah, it is possible to forget these things. But in any case, it wouldn't have made any difference. The, I, the Irish Human Rights Commission declined to get involved, partly on the basis that it wasn't in their three-year plan. So I wouldn't see that as a particularly adequate. But in any case, I knew from a very early stage they weren't going to do anything. The man from the IHRC who interviewed me asked what I meant by blood libel. So he obviously, he didn't even bother to check the meaning of blood libel on the internet before meeting me. So he had done no preparation whatsoever. So obviously I, I knew from an early stage they weren't going to do anything. But one, one, one good result did, uh, one thing did result from my meeting with the Irish Human Rights Commission. I, I noticed that um, I had sent them some material. When I had this meeting, I could see that my letters and attachments were all over the place. The man didn't know which attachment went went which letter. So I decided to, um, to create one particular document 
to summarize all the allegations over the years, uh, which I did. And um, again, I had originally forgotten to put in the Sisters of Mercy allegation, but I added it later. So you can easily find my document online, in the updated document. It's entitled Blood Libel in Ireland Directed Against Catholics, Not Jews. Now I just repeat that. It's Blood Libel in Ireland Directed Against Catholics, Not Jews. And it kind of summarizes everything I have been doing. Well, not everything, but the most important parts of what I've been doing for the past 20 years. And um, again, my, um, my, my blog is irishsalem.blogspot.com. And recently I have done a few articles on the, um, the tomb babies because the, the report, final report was due to be published soon. And uh, slightly to my surprise, I realized that yes, the tomb babies uh, allegations are a little bit what, like what I've been working on for the past 20 years. So 